this with what we're talking about this night. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, you are the true King of glory. Only you. And you are the one who brings justice and righteousness. True justice and a righteousness that we could never earn. And instead, that you could only give to us. And so, Lord, as we prepare our hearts and our minds to remember the path that you walked, the path that you walked to bring justice and righteousness in the world, I pray that you would continue to ready our hearts, Lord. Continue to allow us to feel, to know, to experience your grace and your love, your steadfast love for us. Send your Holy Spirit now as we hear your word this night, that as we hear it, we would believe it, Lord, and that by believing it, we would become the doers of it. We pray, Jesus, in your most holy, your most perfect name. Amen. So the psalm that we read earlier, responsibly, Psalm 136, is on my list of one of my most favorite psalms in all of the psalms. It talks all about God's steadfast love, or as a book that we use for devotion sometimes, the never stopping, never giving up, never ending love of God. And it says it over and over and over and over again. And that idea of God's steadfast love, I think you could make a pretty compelling case that most of Scripture, most of the stories we read about, we hear in Scripture, could be boiled down to God showing, to God giving, to God moving people into the experience of that steadfast love. And see, King David, the author of that psalm that we read, knew too. He knew all about God's steadfast love for him. And he'd experienced it too. It wasn't just a head knowledge thing. He had actually had moments and experiences where he knew that it was the Lord, where God was showing him that steadfast love. Think about the times when he was a shepherd. How God showed him his steadfast love in allowing him to protect the sheep from whatever animal, whatever beast was there to get them. Think about how God showed his steadfast love to David and allowing him to take down the giant Goliath. Think about how God showed his steadfast love to David, allowing him to be victorious over all these enemies, all these invading armies that came against the people of God. David knew intimately. He knew from his own personal life, his own personal experience, what it meant to have, what it meant to know the steadfast love of God. And so, it's not hard then to imagine, it's not hard to understand why he writes this psalm in the way he does. One line about God's action, what God is doing. The next line, for his steadfast love endures forever. Something God does, his steadfast love endures forever. Verse after verse after verse after verse. It is very difficult to miss the point here. It's so clear that David writes this psalm to impress upon our hearts that the steadfast love of God not only endures forever, but is always tied to some sort of action. And so in the 12th verse of this psalm, he writes with an a strong hand and an outstretched arm, the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. And like I said at the start of the service, those words, the strong or a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, is going to be the theme for the next weeks as we gather here on Wednesday nights to get ready to celebrate Easter, to get ready to enter Holy Week. We're going to go through, we'll go through different ways in which God has acted with an outstretched arm tonight to bring justice and righteousness. We'll also see how he did it to serve, to heal, to pray, and to receive sinners. We'll see how all of those things culminate in Jesus most importantly and most of all. And so, let's begin tonight. God reaching out with an outstretched arm to bring justice and righteousness. 
In the words that we read, David recounts the way in which God's people experienced the oppression of the people in the land of Egypt, of the people that were Pharaoh's army, Pharaoh's people as well. He writes, taking out the steadfast love parts, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, to him who divided the Red Sea in two and made Israel pass through the midst of it, but overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea. For his steadfast love endures forever. His steadfast love endures forever. Just try and picture for a moment. It's hard for us people. Try and picture what life might have been like for the chosen people of God in that day. The people who were oppressed by Pharaoh and his people there. How hard it was. How difficult it was. How much they must have suffered. They lived under the rule of what might have been one of the most powerful most mighty nations in all history, but ruled by a cruel and oppressive dictator. As slaves to him, they were at his mercy to be treated how he wanted and however he pleased. And they were. They were beaten. They were forced to do hard labor out in the sun, sweating, being driven like ruthless taskmasters by the supervisors that were placed over them. They were captive, helpless, maybe even hopeless at times, with no seemingly way out. And day after day, I imagine they cried out to God for deliverance, for release from their captivity. And I don't wonder if those voices of crying out began with a roar and then as God continued to not respond, began to dwindle and dwindle and dwindle. But one day, we know the story, God would answer their cry. And through Moses, God would send these ten plagues that would soften the heart of Pharaoh enough to release the people of Israel and let them go. But that softness of his heart didn't last very long. He sent his army after them. He sent all of his army to go get the people of Israel back. Come, go get them, bring them back to us. I shouldn't have sent them away. I can almost hear. I can imagine the shrieks and the cries of people as they looked and saw all of Pharaoh's army pursuing them. And the fear that they must have had what was going on to happen to them when Pharaoh's army got to them. Here they were, fleeing these people that had oppressed them for so many years, but now they were trapped again in a different situation, the Red Sea on one hand, and all of Pharaoh's army in pursuit of them. Helpless, again, ready to just die in the wilderness. But yet, with a strong, a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, God came to deliver his people. And so as Moses lifts up his hand, God calls the east wind to come and split the waters in two so that the Israelites can walk through, not with a little bit of water, but on dry land. On dry land. But God's not done yet. He's not done delivering. He's going to come in an awe-inspiring act of justice. As Pharaoh's army enters into the Red Sea, the waters collapse on them and kills them all. God drowns all of Pharaoh's army. His steadfast love comes with a mighty, mighty hand and an outstretched arm bringing justice to those people. But yet, even that, even that would not last forever. Even that release, even that removing of oppression would not remain for all time. See, in the days of Jesus, people were once again oppressed. God's chosen people experienced oppression again. They weren't forced to make bricks this time. That was sort of a different oppression. So Jerusalem was the holy city. Jerusalem was meant to be ruled by a Jewish king, but instead the people of Israel, God's chosen people, were ruled by the Romans, the cruel Roman Empire. 
But lest we think it was just an outside thing, they were oppressed even by the people inside their own group. The religious leaders, the people in charge, the one whose job it was to actually bring them to God and help them in their lives of faith with their Lord, continued to oppress them, place more and more on their shoulders, demand more sacrifices, demand more strict adherence to the law, more, 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 and more people of God in that day were oppressed by their own. But just like in Moses' time, God was coming again. God was coming. He was sending someone even to come with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm to bring justice and righteousness. Listen again how Matthew tells this tale. He says, Jesus entered the temple drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Again, try and picture what this must have been like for people there who were witnessing this happening. The crippled, the lame, foreigner, the outcast, standing around the hustle and bustle of the temple, the sound of the coins of the money changers ringling and dingling all through the temple. But then all of a sudden comes this Jesus guy. All of a sudden he comes with these mighty hands and he outstretched arms and he starts flipping tables with a furious look in his eyes with a true justice and a righteous anger that none of us could ever possess, he hurls the tables onto the floor. All the coins spill everywhere. And with a voice of righteousness, he says, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. It's a strange, but yet strangely beautiful, too, image of our Lord. One that we don't really see much else. One that we don't really even think about. But in that moment, Jesus reaches out with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm to bring justice and righteousness, to release those people from the oppression they experienced. But even that was not it. Even that awe-inspiring moment in the temple was only a foretaste of what he would do just a week later when he would outstretch his arms on the cross to give righteousness to all who believed in him, when he would take and make justice for all sin, for all people of all time. So he was coming in steadfast love to stretch out his arms for the people's unrighteousness in order that he could give to them his righteousness. He came to rescue, to deliver them from oppression, but not just from earthly rulers, no, from the things that oppress them the most, from sin, from death, from the devil. And But it wasn't just for them, it's for you too. God coming and bringing justice and righteousness delivers you too from the biggest captives that hold you bound Your sin, death, and the devil, you too sit here tonight as a benefactor of Jesus' righteousness. It is free to you. You are made righteous on account of Christ alone. But yet, we still sit here tonight waiting too. We still sit here tonight waiting for Jesus to return for one final act of bringing a mighty hand, an outstretched arm, to finally move in the last act of justice and righteousness. When the words of Amos will be true. When justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That's what our hope is. That's what we long for. That's what we even are yearning for, for Jesus to return. And so for the next weeks, we'll look back at the never ending, the never stopping, the never giving up love of our God and the ways in which he has come to us. 
with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand as you're able as we go before our Lord.